Good evening, everyone. We are in, uh, supposedly, hopefully, today we will finish this series, The Psychology of the Mind and the Soul. And, uh, what is it, number 14, I think, yes, number 14 today. So, last week, we spoke about uh, a person that wants to correct his soul, his nefesh, has to first get to know the power of the nefesh, each part of the nefesh, and the skills and the ability of the nefesh in order for him to cure the problems that he has with his nefesh. This is where we end last week's shiur. And we say that the first thing when a person comes to cure his, his uh, soul and his mind, he has to first know uh, the different parts and the drives and the evil inclination and the power of imagination and the activity of his brain, of his intelligence and his natural nature, all these things in order for him to deal with his problems. Which, are, which apparently almost no one in the world does it because nobody even is aware of the nefesh or the soul. There are so many, so many millions of people who are not even aware that there is such a thing, soul. They don't, they don't get to think about it, not to talk about different parts of the souls and how do you cure certain problems when it comes to it. This is where we end last week. Today we're continuing. The words of the Rambam about Choli and Nefesh. The words of the Rambam, the Maimonides, about the sicknesses of the Nefesh. The Nefesh is the lowest part of the soul of the human being. In the Torah it says, Lo tuchlu et adam, ki adam hu nefesh Don't eat the blood when you eat animals. Make sure you put salt that the blood comes out, because the blood is the lowest part. It's actually the life of the animal. By eating it, you actually get negative things into your system. And we also have blood. We also have the nefesh. Ki adam hu nefesh also by the human being. Death is that all the blood is dripping out of the body. So you see every drop of blood that drips from a person's body, if some people they have this disease, this sickness that the blood does not get clogged. So if they get cut, they have to rush in, into the hospital right away because you know, in two or three hours they'll die. So every drop that drip, then you know another X percentage from the life of this person is gone. The more drips, the more he's, di he's dying. Very simple. At one point, there will not be enough blood in the body and the person will die. So what do you see? This red liquid, which you can put it in a jar or in a bottle, that's really the life of a person. That's what determines if the spiritual spirit and soul will stay in the body or would be forced to leave the body. So without blood in the body, the soul cannot stay in the body. That's a rule. It's a scientific rule. So the Rambam define holy and nefesh that every person has it. Every person has sicknesses in his nefesh. And it's not that just people that you see that they have bad traits or people that cannot control their evil inclination. This is the natural situation of every human being. Every person that was born into this world has some kind of a sickness to his nefesh. That's the purpose of his creation, that he comes here to this world and fix it and fight with that. A person has to work all his life to cure himself, to get to control about his will and desires and to aim them all to a positive direction. This work begins from the minute you were created until the second you died. Getting educated to go and improve your traits to make them better and better starts actually from the day you were born until the day you died. Right away. It starts from the minute you understand what's happening here, what life is about, you have an obligation to work and to fight and to cure those problems and those sicknesses. Like Chazal says in the Gemara, Yitzro shel adam mitchadesh alav bechol yom veyom. The evil inclination of a person is renewed every day. It's not something that comes and you fight it and it's gone. No, tomorrow it will come again and the next day. 
one time you held yourself not to get angry, it doesn't mean tomorrow you will be able to also do it. Or the next day. You can do it 10 times and then the 11 times you lose control. Right? You have desire to steal. 10 times you did not touch. The 11 time you did touch. Meaning the problem is constantly attacking. Until you're able to remove it directly from the root or to cure the root, then these problems will continue to attack you every day. It's a new thing. It's a new battle. Right? So, however, the Rambam says, מכל מקום אין כוונת הרמב״ם לומר שכל אחד שלא תיקן מידותיו זקוק לעזרה מקצועית של פסיכולוג. When we say that, that everyone is mentally sick, everyone is nefesh is sick, that's why you came to the world, it doesn't mean that everyone has to be attached to a psychologist, that every day needs to be treated by a psychologist. Because these are natural sicknesses that we came to the world, that doesn't mean we have to sit by a psychologist every day to take care of the problem. The point is that everyone will do everything he can to cure himself. And when he needs an advice, he has to consult with the doctors of the souls. Who are the doctors of the souls? The rabbis. The people that learn Torah, they have the wisdom of the Torah, the divine wisdom. How do I attack? How do I fight my bad traits? This is the words of the Rambam. Mahalot Amidot. Let's talk about the status, the skills of the traits. What does it mean? This is a situation that a person is control, controlling his energy, controlling his power to do good things. As we saw in uh, chapter 4 of Shmona Prakim of the Rambam, it's a balance between two extremes. You have uh, all the way to the left and all the way to the right. Right there in the middle, it's the average. Meaning a person, a person, he can, man, he can uh, adjust his midot to be in a certain path. Meaning he's in control. Pchitut midot, lack of... Uh, level of the traits is when the natural desire natural desire that a person is born with right we all have animal instinct and animal desires food uh, relations uh, uh, all kinds of physical pleasure that we are born with if a person did not educate himself correctly to always push his, his uh, skills and his energy to the right direction the natural desires will take over and control him. Meaning they'll push you to where they want you to go. So if a person does not fight to control his habits and desires, the nature that he was born with will dominate him, will push him to places where the evil inclination want you there. Therefore, it's very important because if you're not going to take control of your life, you will be maneuvered by your evil inclination, which is some of the bad traits that you came to the world with and your physical desires, they'll take over your life. Cigarettes, drugs, alcohol, women, food, money, all kinds of uh, things that people run after, they will actually take over your life and from this moment on, I don't have to tell you what's gonna be the consequences. The person would lose the purpose of his creation. That's not why Hashem put you here in a world here just to enjoy this physical world and die and then have to deal with the fact that you didn't keep your obligations. That's a very big, very dangerous situation. That's called Pchitut Nefesh. The words of the Rambam, Raui lo leargil atzmo bepeulot tovot. Person has to know to make himself used to do good things. עד שיהיו לו המעלות ויתרחק מהפעולות הרעות until they become superb and make him run away from the bad actions עד שיסורו ממנו הפחיתויות that all the negative that you have in you eventually would leave you slowly slowly you get rid of it אשר הן נמצאות איתו ולא יאמר שהן בעניין שאינן יכולות להשתנות you shouldn't say no there's no way to change my nature רבי that's the way I was born כי כל עניין אפשר להשתנות מן הטוב אל הרע ומן הרע אל הטוב, והכל בבחירתו. Don't say 
There's nothing I can do. I was born like that. I have had blood, Rabbi. I cannot control my anger. I have this, I have this desire. Since I'm a kid, I'm like that. So therefore, don't expect me to change. I, I can't control it. I can't help it, like they say. Beloni, if you try hard, if you do it correctly, you'll definitely be able to improve yourself until you get rid of the negative completely. Rabbeinu Yonah brings a proof from the Gemara in Masechet Yonah, Yoma, page 38. He says, Aba li'tair mesayim oto. Aba li'tameh potchim lo. Someone that comes to, to get purified gets help from Shemaim, from heaven. Someone who comes to become impure, potchim lo, they open for him. As you can see, the language is different. When you come to purify yourself, it says they help you from heaven. When you come to impurify yourself, to make, making, to make scenes, they open you the door. Why is it a different language? It's a different language here. Why is it? Because when a person, when a person, obviously a person has a bhira. So when he comes to, to the impurity, right, they're opening him the door. Because when it comes to something positive, you need a lot of help because you go against your nature and against your Yetzirah. But when you want to make scenes, you, you don't need any help. Automatically, this is your nature. Automatically, you do it. To be a tzaddik, you need help from Shamaim. You need help. It's very hard to overcome the Yetzirah and the temptation. But to be a Rasha, you don't need any help from Shamaim. It's a natural thing to be a Rasha. By the way, to eat whatever you see, to make scenes, to go after the physical pleasure, you don't need help for that, right? Did you ever need to convince someone to come to a party? If you have a friend that likes parties, music, women, this, good food, do you need to convince him to come? As soon as you tell him it's a party, he's already two days doesn't sleep. But when you tell him come to Shiur Torah, for a whole week you have to sweat to convince him to come. Right? Even if he likes the Shiur Torah, he still won't come. Why? Because the Yetzirah is holding him by the neck, choking him. But for negative things, you don't need to convince anyone to. Right away, they run. It's not possible that a person will be created immediately superb with his nature. And without any skills. Meaning, what the Rambam is saying here, nobody decreed on you to be a loser or to be a winner. It's 100% in your hand. The same thing, no baby was born a diamond cutter or a mechanic or a dentist. You want to be a dentist? It will take you a few years to learn. You want to be a mechanic? It will take you a few months to learn. Everything takes time to learn. No one was born ready in anything. So therefore, you were not born Rasha and you were not born Tzaddik. Meaning, yes, it could be that you're reincarnation of a Rasha or reincarnation of a tzaddik. Yeah, that's yes. But now in your, in your new life as a baby, how is going to be in your traits and how you develop them and you're going to the right direction, to the wrong direction, is something that you choose. It's true that some things is easier for you than others. Some things it's easier. For instance, not all the kids have the same desire for candy. One kid all day candy, all day. The other one, Shabbat. Six days is okay without it. But the other one goes crazy. One is into sport all day. The other one is not attracted to it. So obviously you see that people have different skills, different uh, desires. Right? Adam, yeah, Adam, some people, the way Hashem made the brain, 
some are dry, some are more wet, some are more pure, some are less pure. Therefore, they are, it's affecting a person. Some people, they have great memory. They remember every detail. Telephone numbers, dates, date of birth. You know, some people, they know everyone's date of birth. They know everything, when to do, and you know, all kinds of things. And you wonder how they remember so much. Some people, their memory is horrible. They don't remember after a minute, they forget. They come to a Torah lecture. Before they leave the door, they don't remember one thing they heard in the last two hours. Tell them, can you say one thing that you heard in a lecture? You've been sitting for two hours enjoying. What is the thing they will remember? The joke. If it was a joke or two, they'll remember the joke. And even the jokes, they'll forget a minute later. What is it? So, the person has a mezeg. Meaning, a mezeg is uh, your, your status. You come to the world with a certain status. And you have your traits. If you won't take advantage on the skills that Hashem gave you, your brain, your talent, your memory, Yishayer sachal bli safek, you'll stay full all your life. Doesn't mean you have a sharp, sharp brain, it's automatically gonna make you smart. You gotta use it. You use the, the gift that Hashem gave you. Okay? Some people have hot temper from a young age. Short fuse. Every little thing turn them on fire. Some people are cold as ice. Cold as ice. You understand? It's very interesting how sometimes people complain. No matter what they have, they complain. One guy come to me, complain, his wife is cold as ice, meaning in intimacy. The other one, an hour later, complain that his wife is the total opposite. He, he say, if this, the things will continue like this, I'm gonna have to divorce her because I cannot keep up with her energy. See, everyone has a different complaint. But it's funny how two people complain about two opposites. <laughs> I say, if I take half from this guy and half from this guy and make them an average, they will be perfect. Supposedly none of them will complain. But everyone with this problem. So, same thing by the person. You already have a certain temper. Now is the goal to get it to the right direction. For instance, some people physically strong from a young age, kids. Why? They eat the same. Twins. They eat the same. Same mother feed them. One is muscular, strong. The other one is more weak. It's very interesting. So we see that whatever you are born with is in your hand 100% to develop and to achieve something with it. People think that correcting the traits is only for ordinary people like us but it doesn't apply to the big righteous people the biggest rabbis in the world they need to fix their midot come on rabbi it's not for me for you yeah for us for ordinary people but for people those big names that we hear all the time they don't have these issues right he already fixed his traits the Rambam in chapter 4, he say, even Tzadik Ador, the most righteous person in the world, has a need all his life to fix his midot. Ego, pride, lack of patience, generosity, kindness, devotions, laziness, anger, so many things. For sure he has at least one or two problems. Even if he knows the whole Torah already, everything. Even if he learned thousands of hours how to fix his midot, these things don't live so easy. To become perfect, it takes many, many years. So the Rambam say, even Moshe Rabbeinu, even Moshe Rabbeinu had this need. And sometimes he fell. And he gives an example of Mei Meriva. When the Jews, they cry for water and all these things. And Moshe Rabbeinu lost his temper. So meaning the Rambam hint that if Moshe would go harder and try a little bit more, maybe it wouldn't happen to him. Meaning his purpose in life is also to overcome certain situations. And you know, 
שהאדון הראשונים והאחרונים משה רבנו and you know that the masters of all masters משה רבנו עליו השלום כבר אמר אליו השם יתברך השם say to משה יען לא האמנתם בי להקדישני לעיני בני ישראל על השם מריתם את פי למי מריבה על אשר לא קידשתם אותי בתוך בני ישראל So Hashem said to Moshe, because you did not believe in me to sanctify me in front of the nation of Israel, and you went against my instructions, and you did not sanctify me in the nation of Israel, what happened? They got punished. Meaning, Hashem only punished for something that it's your fault. Meaning you did it, you could have not done it if you would work harder. The fact that you did it, brought to you a punishment and you could control yourself not to get angry. The Khatam Sofer is talking now about the influence of the evil inclination on our intelligence, our brain. Let me tell you a story. Many years, the Khatam Sofer did not see his mother in his yeshiva. Uh, he lived in Hungary over 200, 250 years ago. <laughs> he used to say, to give a class to students 365 days a year. Now one day off. Always give, learn, teach Torah. And never had time to go to visit his mother that lived far. One time his mother sent him a letter. She's asking him to come visit her. She's getting old. She doesn't know when else she's going to be able to see her. The Khatam Sofer felt it's not a decision for me to make. I cannot make the decision on my own. On one hand, is my mother want me to come visit her and I have to go visit her because it's respecting your mother and father, which I am obligated from the Torah. On the other hand, I'm going to cancel the teaching to the public Teaching to the public, it's also very important, the most important. So how would I decide now? It's a, a catch-22, no? I cannot make a decision. Even though he was a big dayan, he was a judge in a shul and a very big rabbi. And he was answering the questions to all the people. So who's going to answer the question for him, right? But he felt, I'm not objective over here, right? So he took some of the judges in his bed din, and he made them a bed din to make a decision about his doubt. And they, and they decided, they ruled. What was the ruling? What do you think? If you be one of those judges, you would say that he has to go visit his mother before she died? Or he continued to give the shiur in yeshiva and teach the public? What do you think? The lady is over there, for sure, say, of course, he has to go visit his mother, come on. And the guys, no, what is the guy saying? He should go to visit his mother or he should continue to teach Torah? All the guys agree, teach Torah? Ah, Ben Zion, what would you say now? If you and your wife will wait for your son and he's one year in yeshiva, he didn't come, no holiday, no Shabbat, no nothing. But now one year, 20 years like this. You don't see him at all. And there's no telephone, no WhatsApp, no Facebook, no video chatting, none of the things that they have today. Meaning there's not even a telephone. No contact. Here and there somebody comes from out of town and he tells you that he met him and he's good. That's it. You don't know that much. It all goes by letters until the letter arrives. So now... You have to make a decision to tell him, come see mommy or stay there to teach Torah. After all these years. It's not easy, no? So he put a bed in to sit. And the bed in, that was their answer. What was their answer? Shelo isa levakeret imo. You don't go and visit your mother. Stay here and teach the people. That's above everything in life. Teaching Torah is always going to be a winner, always, no matter what the dilemma is. It's, it's a very, very serious story here. 
First of all, someone like Khatam Sofer was one of the biggest rabbis in the world of 250 years ago. That's much, much, much greater than this generation. He felt that there are some issues that the Yetzer Hara still controlling, which he cannot make the right decision. And he needs to put a group of rabbis to hear his dilemma and to rule for him what to do. You understand? Unbelievable how it goes. Even people like Moshe and Aaron could not testify for each other, two brothers. Moshe, ma, Moshe you, don't, you suspect Moshe is a liar? Ma, Moshe is not going to say the truth? It doesn't matter. Even if he means to say the truth, once it's his, his brother, he doesn't see the picture correctly anymore. It's affecting on your, your subconscious. So it's very difficult to see the truth when you are connected to the situation. One of the difficulties of curing the mind, the soul, is because most people think that they are actually already cured. I'm stable, I'm good, mentally I'm doing very well. I'm not like this guy or this guy or this girl that they're mentally unstable and they're not normal. No, I'm very normal, right? That's what most people think. Some people, or actually most of the people, they actually enjoy their bad characters and bad traits. They enjoy it. He has desire for food. He enjoy that desire. He goes to this restaurant, that, vacation, that, what's going to eat, what we're going to do on Shabbat, it's Bukharian wedding, seven floors, what we're going to put in each floor, you know? All here is preparing for the moment. Take it away from his life. Kill me. You might as well kill me. Some people, you take away the whiskey from them, or the vodka and a Shabbos table, you destroy their Shabbat. So that's it, I don't, I'm not Shomer Shabbat anymore. What? The rabbi said, I cannot drink anymore. <laughs> that's it, you, you kill their own Shabbat. So they enjoy their bad traits. Without it, they don't want to leave. That's another problem. How are you going to fix something? It's like people who smoke drugs. You tell them you have to quit, it destroy your life. No, without it, I, don't, I hate my life. I love it. All day I'm waiting for it. You tell me I have to fix it? I don't want to fix it. I remember when I was a kid, my father was constantly warning me not to start smoking, and it worked. But when one time one person told him, why don't you quit? What was his answer? Huh? No, he didn't say I can't. He said, I can, but I won't quit. Why? I love it. I enjoy to smoke. You understand the point or no? Meaning, I know it's bad. If I want to stop, I can. If it's true or not, you know it's not so simple. But I won't do it. Why? Because I enjoy it. Why should I live without that pleasure? That's how most people are. They enjoy it. In anything. Not necessarily cigarettes or drugs or alcohol or women or food, whatever. And it's in everything in life. He's convinced that it's good. And on the good, he's actually convinced that it's bad. Yesterday, a kid came to see me, 17 years old. I told him, I'm going to try to help you to get into yeshiva. I'm going to do this. I'm gonna... So he said to me, I don't want to, I want to learn uh, secular. I don't want to learn too much Torah. So I said, why? He said, I don't want it. What is he going to do for me? I'm not interested. So in his mind, if he's going to learn English and math, it's going to help him one day. If he learns Torah, it won't help him. Meaning Hashem is not a factor in his life. Bichlal. The Torah, what the Torah says about someone that learns Torah, it doesn't apply to him. This is what he's talking about. They are convinced that the good is bad and the bad is good. Sometimes there's a situation that a person really knows he's sick, I have a mental issue, I know it, like OCD people. 
Some admit, some don't. But I know some people that admit, say, yeah, I have this problem, I cannot control it. Right? And they need a remedy, they need medicine. But he convinced himself that there's no medicine to his situation, and the medicine usually don't help and make it worse. Many people that you tell him, why don't you go to the psychiatrist? He's going to give you medication for your situation. Ah, the medication only make it worse. It, it doesn't help anyway. I give you an example. A person can say, it's good. Why are you so stubborn? It's good that I'm stubborn. And you made al sheli. I'm not changing my opinion so easy. I don't let people take advantage on me. I'm not going to be... That's the right word for it. I'm not going to be easy to take advantage of, etc. And finally, when he understands that he's bad, and he has to cure his, his nefesh, Usually the way what he's going to do is going to get after the, the false medicine, not the good one. You understand? So therefore, for instance, he's going to start fasting. He's going to roll himself in the ice. He's going to do all kinds of things, thinking that's what's going to make him a tzaddik. But that's baloney. He doesn't really touch the root of the problem. Ve'yaziru min ha'raot asher em yachshavu bahem shem tovot. Sometimes a person thinks that everything by me is good. I don't have a need to change. But the rabbi that knows him well, he said to him, your direction is dangerous. You're not going in the right path. You have to stop this, you have to stop that, you have to work on this. For instance, there are guys in the yeshiva, they learn until very late at night. The yeshiva finishes at 10 p.m., 1 a.m. is still there. Extra learning. Extra. And the next morning, they don't wake up on time. Until they fell asleep, it was 2. They have to wake up at 6, 6.30. It's hard for them. So they miss Kriyat Shema, which is mitzvah from the Torah, on the time. And of course, they miss Tfilah in Minyan. The yeshiva already prayed, so now he has to put Tfilin in his room quickly and pray by himself. You ask them, what's with Kriyat Shema? How did you not do Kriyat Shema today? That's it, you lost the mitzvah for life. There's no way to get it back. What's with davening with Minyan? Some guys would say, I learned until late at night. Learning Torah, we all know it's the most important mitzvah. Meaning, don't talk to me about one mitzvah here, one mitzvah there. I did thousands of mitzvot last night. So he's thinking, I learn extra two, three hours. It's tens of thousands of mitzvot. So big deal. I miss one or two mitzvot in the morning. It's good to sacrifice two mitzvot to get tens of thousands of mitzvot. Very good business decision, no? What do you think? Good or bad? Some guys... It would bother them that they miss Kriyat Shema and they didn't pray in Minyan. But they're still not able to go to sleep early on time to be able to wake up on time. They will continue to learn until late, knowing tomorrow again I'm not going to wake up. And the next day, if you ask them, did you ask a Chacham if what you're doing is right or wrong? What's going to be the answer? Of course not. They don't ask. They already assume that that's what it is. So therefore, we have to know one thing. We have a system of rules. It's true that some mitzvot could be a million times greater than others. Right? Obviously. Learning Torah, it's a perfect example. Saving souls, it's a perfect example. It's one mitzvah, one obligation with trillions of profits. And some mitzvot, one mitzvah, one prophet, that's it. So if I have to sacrifice two, three of the small mitzvot to get the huge, the jackpot, what is the question even, right? That's the way people think. 
but it's not true. I can give you a few proofs. To read Megillah in Purim, it's mitzvah from Rabbanan, rabbinical mitzvah. There's no obligation from the Torah to go hear Megillah. It's mitzvah of Chachamim. But you, those who sit in Yeshiva and learn, they're going to waste at least an hour of learning, at least, until they get there, until they hear the Megillah, until, until they come back. It's an hour of learning. That's 60,000 mitzvot from the Torah, which each one of them is the most important one. And the Chachamim never ever stop talking about the importance of the Torah all their life. The Talmud is full of hundreds of examples. They will give their life for the Torah, not to waste a minute. So the Chachamim that taught us the value of the Torah in thousands, thousands of times in the Talmud, they made a decree, everybody has to close the Gemara and go and listen to Megillah. What you see over here? When you have a system of rules, you don't do this calculation. What you obligate to do, it comes in a specific time, you have to do. Otherwise, why are we even praying? Better we learn Torah all the time. Why closing the Gemara and pray now 20 minutes? Why praying one hour Shachrit? You don't need. We learn Torah and that's it. On top of it, we have a rule, our Sekba Mitzvah patur mina mitzvah. If you're busy with, with mitzvah, you are dismissed from another mitzvah if they fall in the same time. Why? Because you're already busy with mitzvah. So based on that, why are we doing any mitzvot? Just sit and learn all your life Torah, and you don't need to do any other mitzvah. No tefillin, no talit, no tefillah, no kriyat shema, no nothing. Obviously, that's what it, not what it means. It means if I'm sitting and learning Torah now, and they need someone to go and make chatan and kala happy in their wedding, which is mitzvah, I don't have to do it. There's other people who can do it. They don't learn. Let them go and make them happy. They need to bury someone that doesn't have who to bury him. He died. I don't have to do it. Let other people that do not learn do it. I'm learning. But when I'm learning and mitzvah comes right now of Zman Kriyat Shema, if I continue to learn, I'm going to miss that mitzvah. It's mitzvah over it. I must stop learning and do the mitzvah. I cannot come and say, oh, I was busy with learning, so I didn't have to do the mitzvah. No, no, no. Once you have a set of rules, and they have specific times, specific dates. That comes before everything. Why? Because why would Hashem give it otherwise? Hashem would write. If you learn Torah, none of this applies to you, the rules. But the Torah warns every Jew, be careful not to do this, be careful to do that. Why? I learn Torah, I don't have to be careful. No, no, no. If I tell you to eat matzah and pass overnight, you're not going to tell me I was busy learning Gemara, that's why I didn't eat matzah. Once a year, you must eat matzah. And, and Hashem knew that you're going to have to close the Gemara for it. Right? And still an obligation. Or in all the other things that the Torah says. Top. Ask someone, why is he fighting for this? Some people are zealous. They fight for things. He will tell you, what do you mean? I'm fighting for Kvoda Torah. The honor of the Torah. Ask him, did you consult with a big rabbi if it's good to do what you do? Padakta etzel poseka dora imutar lasot et mashta ose bishvil kvod ha Torah? You're making a lot of noise and all kinds of wars. Did you ask a Talmid Chacham to rule to you if that's what you should do? Or it's your opinion that you have to do? He will, he will say, what are you talking about? To ask a rabbi for something so obvious? I'm giving my life for the Torah. What do you mean? I need to ask a rabbi if I should demonstrate or I should do something because people disgrace the Torah? But he doesn't understand that actually what he does come from his subconscious. He has drives that he's not aware of that pushing him to do what he does. That's what we say because it's called pchitut la nefesh. Pchitut la nefesh. He's going to answer to you dozens of explanation why what he does, it's superb. But in reality, it's really the opposite. What push him to do it, it's different things. Sometimes, ego. Ego. The people that did what they do did not consult with him first. They did not invite him to participate with them. So he's so hurt that they don't consider him as one of them, 
Now when he finally saw they made a mistake and they did something wrong, all of a sudden he's willing to die for the honor of the Torah and he begins to make a lot of noise. Why is it? He thinks, and again, you can connect him to a lie detector, he will, he will pass the test. What am I fighting for? I'm fighting Lashem Shamaim to stop the disgrace. But really the only reason that it's all started because in your subconscious, in the back of your mind, you are so hurt and humiliated that that's what really makes you so upset now for what they're doing. You will not be so upset if they would not put an X on you before. Or oh, that person that you hate so much is behind it. So it's very difficult for you now to see that really the reason behind everything, it's really personal. It's anger. It's all kinds of reasons. It's going very deep. Kegon, iftach b'milchama. Iftach in the war. I give you an example what it means. If you open a, a war sometimes about something, you're in yeshiva, something happened in yeshiva and you start a war. But you don't really calculate, you don't calculate the damage that can happen from that war. For instance, Chilul Hashem. Maybe you caught someone in a yeshiva is doing something terrible. Fighting a war, fight, starting a war against him on the public maybe will make him stop what he does. But will make all of that goes in the internet now. And in a secular news. And they're going to make such a party out of it. And it's going to make a lot of religious people weak. People from the yeshiva did such a thing. It's going to make them weak. So maybe you fix one issue, but you cause thousands. You understand? Many years ago, when I was young, somebody that I knew, it wasn't a modest person. And that's an understatement. I was doing non-kosher things. And uh, few people knew about it. And there was one big tzaddik came from Israel and this, that person, he was making people becoming religious. He was giving speeches and doing all kinds of things. And one, one I, today I understand it. 20 something years ago I didn't understand it. But today I understand it because today when you get older you see things in life and you understand things better. And this, it was back then, that, that rabbi was maybe 65 back then and he came and he said, no one should say anything. What do you mean? It's a criminal. Yes, he is. But everybody must be silent about it. I said to him, why? He said, he makes people religious, and for that we have to all be quiet. Meaning, I wish he won't do the crimes that he does. But don't make big deal out of it. Don't make noise. I'm going to talk to him. I'm going to send this guy to talk to him. We will try to stop him quietly. I couldn't understand. I said, well, you allow a criminal to continue with his action just because he's also doing good things? But later, someone else told me that he spoke to him after. And his calculation was, what's going to happen when the public will find out that their guru is actually a corrupted faker? What would happen to them? If there, is, there are a thousand people who inspire them, maybe half of them will go back to become Mechalele Shabbat. Disaster. Better to deal with these crimes on the, under the ground than to make a big open war against it that will cause many casualties. Do you understand the, the calculation? This is what he's talking about. Now, once it becomes personal, it's very difficult for the person that fight to care about the collateral huge damage that will happen from his personal war. Of course he denies it personal. It's always for the sake of heaven. Always. Everyone who fights will always use this excuse. L'shem Shamayim. 
לשם שמיים. לשם שמיים. Usually people, usually people say, think, that when a person decides to do something, it comes from the brain. The brain makes the decision and then follows the actions. After the brain decides, comes the will to execute the action. So you have the mind, then you have the, the will, meaning ratzon, that you want to do it, and then you actually materialize it into actions. Three steps, A, B, and C. That's how people think. But the truth is the, exactly the opposite. The truth is the opposite. The Rambam, the Gaon Mivilna, Rabbi Israel Misalan, they all explain that what makes the decision is the willpower. You want to go make a sin. You have a desire for something. I'm tired without this sin already. It's too long. I got to go and relax myself. So you have a will to go and do something that it's illegal. It's against the Torah. You have a drive. That's the will. It could be good will or a bad will. You have now a will to go and do, to hurt someone, to go and kill someone. Or you have a will to go open a yeshiva, to go give a big donation. That's also a will. It could be good or bad. Depends where it comes from. From the good inclination or the evil inclination. Then after that, second step is the brain, the intelligence, the knowledge, your wisdom. All of that is called sechel in the holy language. Remember this word, sechel. It's include everything in it. Intelligence, uh, wisdom, knowledge, all of that together called sechel. Then the sechel comes as the advisor to the will. So first you chose that you want to do something. Now the sechel begin to give you an advice. Is your advisor, whether it's good or it's bad. If you want to open yeshiva. Now the, the intelligence, the sechel begins to give you advices. Go to this rich guy, go to that rich guy. This guy will help you. He likes you. This guy likes to give money for yeshivot. All these ideas that come to you, who should you talk to? Talk to this rabbi, talk to him, go find a place, ask the real estate broker where I can buy a land to build the yeshiva, what kind of yeshiva I'm going to build, who is going to teach there, who is going to be the Rosh Yeshiva, when, where, all these things, it's come all from the Sechel, all these advices. But if you want to make a scene, let's say you want to rob a bank, now the circle begins to give you advices how to do it. You have to do it at night. You have to make sure no one is there. Wait for this date. No one is there. There's no security. You have to do it like this. You have to do it like this. But, but you know, it gives you all this advice. So the circle is giving plans for execution based on the decision of the will. Imagine it's like three different partners, three people. First one, get the idea what needs to be done. Second one, begin to give all the advice how to do it. And the third one is the actual executor. He is going to follow on the plan. It's my much like three partners in a business. Okay. This is all in your head. The Rambam is writing in Shmonash uh, Prakim. The Sechel, remember what I say, intelligence, wisdom, all of that, it's the Sechel. He is a servant of the will. Meaning you first choose if to sin or not, if to do a mitzvah or not. And the Sechel is the one who gives you all the plan, how to do it, what's the best way to succeed with your plan. That's it. That's how we go. Not like people think. People think that the sin comes from your knowledge, from Sechel. No. You first want to do a sin, then you begin with the excuses. This is what Hashem said to Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu said to Hashem, why are you telling me to write in the Torah, Naase Adam Betzalmenu? 
Let's make a person in our image. He's speaking in a plural language. Why? People may think there's more than one God. And Hashem said to Moshe, be quiet and write it down. Someone that would like to be mistaken will find how to be mistaken. What kind of an answer is this? Who wants to be mistaken? Who wants to live in mistake? Hashem said to Moshe, you really think that because I'm telling you now to write in a plural language, that's the reason why people would believe in more than one God? And they'll be idol worshippers and they'll do all the other sins that they do? Really think that because of that they're going to do it? Because they, they're going to have something that tricked them here in the Torah? No. First of all, how many times in the Torah it said there's only one God, I'm the only one, before me there was no other, after me there will not be another, there's no one above the heaven and no one below the earth. And so many verses in the Torah that shows that I'm the only God. Now there is one verse over here that speaks in a plural language because it's me and the angels that are creating the human being. Now they're going to think there's more than one God. But it gets deeper. Hashem said to Moshe, this is how it goes. A person decided to make a sin. It's in his mind. Even inclination told him, come on, it's been a long time since you made that sin. Go and do it. Enjoy tonight. There's a parody in Manhattan. Enjoy tonight. Only one night. Yom Kippur is in a month. He'll fix it. Don't worry. So first come the will, the desire. Now you're going to find a way to justify it. To relax your conscience. To block the mouth of all the people who speak against you your roommate that tried to prevent you from going, your rabbi who said to you, don't that make mistake, you're going to regret it. You have already answers to everyone. Usually the way it works, they come with excuses. You know what? I have doubts in the Torah, rabbi. I'm not so sure anymore. <laughs> ah, you have doubts? What is the doubt? How come it says like this? I heard this, uh, uh, this uh, atheist, he said he has a very good point. And this one, and I read in the internet, and I saw that movie. I tell you the truth, it made me very weak. All this is cover up for the fact that he met a beautiful girl, and she went like this to him, and he fell in love with her, and he wants to go make scenes, and he knows against the Torah. So now all the things come, all these drives, to make the road straight and smooth into his target. It's very rare that he's going to say, Rabbi, you're right, I'm such a loser, I'm such a weak character. Why don't I watch my eyes? How can I even consider to do such thing? Pray for me, lock me in a room, do something to save me. Because I myself cannot save myself. You don't hear people talk like that. If they would talk like this, I don't think anyone would be angry at them. At least he's honest. There's always going to be excuses. I read that book, I heard that kofer. You say one time like this, but I found out it's not true. It's all excuses. Why? Because he also saw thousands of proofs that the Torah is the word of God and Hashem is very angry when people do what he's about to do. What happened to all of that? It was all forgotten in a minute because he saw one contradiction, supposedly. What about all the truth that you saw? Right? If a person gave you thousand checks in the business that you're with him and they're all cleared, and now one check bounce. So you said, I'm going to help you to kill him. Remember, you asked me for help? I'm going to help you to kill him. Why? One check bounce. But what about the thousand that went through? In a minute, it's forgotten. This is the way people are. You understand? So the Rambam say that the Sechel is a servant of the will. He gives an advice Sometimes the Sechel gives an advice not to do. What, what are you going to get by robbing a bank? Imagine if you get caught, you're going to sit 20 years in prison. There's so many criminals over there, they're going to kill you over there. You're going to have no life, you won't see your children. This is also Sechel. The Sechel now gives a good advice. Sometimes the Sechel will tell you, why you want to go make a scene with this girl? What are you going to get? half an hour of pleasure and then you're going to get such a punishment from Hashem, you lose your Olam Abba, what are you going to get? That's a good Sechel. Sometimes the Sechel say, yeah, it's about time. You're too fanatic. You don't care, take care of yourself. What, you think the religion is only to suffer? Once in a while you can break the rules. Nothing will happen. 
after, after all, you learn so good, and Yom Kippur, and you pray, and you give a lot of tzedakah, and you do such wonderful things in the world. So every once in a while, you make a scene here and there. So now I want to ask you a question. How come sometimes the Sechel will give you a good advice, and sometimes the Sechel will give you a bad advice? Who is in charge of that Sechel? Who is pressing the buttons over there? Sometimes, even on the same scene, this month, you wanted to go and do it, the Sechel gave you a strong argument why you shouldn't. The following month, the same Sechel, the same head, told you, yeah, yeah, you need to do it. Come on, it's about time. Do it one time, relax. Do tshuva after that, everything will be fine. Why would the same Sechel once give you this advice and then what, it's two different people sitting inside? Good and bad, what's going on here? Why one time positive comes out of the Sechel? Why sometimes negative? Who is in charge? Is it in my hand? Can I change the advice that the Sechel will give me against my evil inclination or it's not in my hand? Very good. It's 100% in my hand. All I have to do is to sit and learn. If I sit and learn Musar or listen to lectures every day. So when I finally have the desire in front of my eyes, immediately my Sechel will rush to save me. Because the, the Sechel is full of holiness right now. From the last days and months that I've been learning and knowing and, and, and understanding how things work by Hashem. But if my Sechel is influenced from the movies I watch all day, and from the bad places I go to, and from the horrible things that I listen to, what kind of strength my Sechel will have to defend me? It's like two different lawyers. One is very devoted, very serious, went to the best law school, all day is learning the new rules, learning different tribes, learning what this judge ruled, this judge, finding, constantly improving, all his head is constantly in a trial in a courtroom. The other lawyer, prima donna, is convertible, two days of the week he's on the beach, here and there he takes a case, his mind is in a different place. He has plenty of money anyway. His mind is not in the court system. When his client will need help, the one that is heading in the court system will find 5,000 ideas how to get him off the hook. And the other one tell him, take, take the plea. Take the plea. Why? Well, I'm going to start killing myself, thinking, learning all kinds of similar cases. Even judges. Judges, how they become good judges? It's not only that you're sharp brain and you're clever to know who is right and who is wrong. No. You need a lot of experience in a, in a subject. If you have a case, and this case is about stocks, you have to learn a lot of similar cases. And it will help you, it will give you ideas how to handle the trial. In Israel, once a year, the lawyers give a mark to the judges. You know, you go from one, one courtroom to another. One of the provisions is how prepared is the judge to the case? How prepared he was? From one to five stars. One is the worst, five is the best. How polite the judge is? How professional he is? How he conduct the trial? How knowledgeable he was in the details of the case? Some judges, they forget about what the lawsuit is. Remind me what we're talking here about today? No, no joke. In the middle of the trial, let's remember what the claim were. Hold on one minute, five minutes break. He begins to read now again the prosecution. The prosecution forgot. He has to remember. The other one, he remember every detail of the last year in his head. His whole life is the case. Obviously, there's different judges. So, what do we see over here? The Rambam says, Asechel can give advice not to do this. You're going to end up in jail. You're going to have a lot of embarrassment. It's against Hashem. It's against the Torah. The, bra the brain, the Sechel, does not make the decision. He only gives advice. And he's an advisor. 
if to promote the will or to depress the will. That's it. The will is the, is the boss. Power of will, which animals do not have, only people have. And he gives the will and advice also how to execute the will. Two advices. One, if to do or not to do, what will be the consequences? And second, finally, when you make the decision to do or not to do, he will give you an advice either how to get out of it I will give you an advice how to go into it and succeed. You understand? Meaning to eliminate the bushod, the shame, whatever you can do in order for you to succeed in your will. The most simple way that a person can examine himself if his decisions come from good or bad is, what do you think is the best way to examine yourself? Before I tell you the answer. How do you know if what comes out of your will is positive or negative? Sometimes it's very tricky. Maybe what I want is a sin. Maybe what I want is a mitzvah. Uh, can you swear that every one of your decisions is loved by Hashem? Even when you're sure that you're doing a mitzvah? How do you know? How do you know? I heard a story. Somebody called me to complain that there was one woman she used to be religious, from a very religious family. She rebelled against the family and the system, like some of these kids. She went out of religion, and she decided to live with a woman. That's what she want to be now. Secular, like a Goya, rebel against Hashem, doesn't want to get married, no man, she's not interested in men. She lives with a woman now. So one person called me to complain that a woman, a religious woman, wants to help her to adopt baby. And it's killing him. And he argues with this religious woman, and she insists she wants to do it. So he's asking me, who is right, me or her? I say to her, are you not ashamed to help a criminal that rebel against Hashem in the worst way possible to help her to achieve her goal. She doesn't deserve any assistance. If any, you should fight her to the end. She doesn't deserve a prize, she's a criminal. And she said, no. Obviously she's not righteous, but it doesn't mean I shouldn't help her to have a baby on her own. Who's right? What do you think? Huh? Everyone is in shock. Do you see what things rabbis have to deal with every hour? What's the right answer? The general rule is you're not allowed to help any criminal who rebel against Hashem in any possible way. Not with money, not with advice, not with car. Not with giving him a ride, not with assistance, not to host him in your house, not to feed him, nothing. That's the rule. Why? If someone come on the way to hit your father and to spit in his face and to curse him, would you run to give him assistant or a prize? Maybe you order him a book of instruction how to kill your father from Amazon. Be nice. Well, what does I have to do one with the other, Rabbi? I want to be a good person. He needs help. I helped him. But it's your father on the other side. Your father gets upset from that person. Why would you choose the wicked over the righteous? It's like these people who fight that murderers and terrorists should not get the death penalty. They should have rights. They should have good food and doctors and vaccines and sport and degrees in jail. Let's help them. By helping them, you are cruel to who? To the victims and their families. Why would you go help the monsters and make the victims, the righteous people, torture them? Why? It's one way or the other. Helping him is making the righteous tortured. Helping the righteous is making the wicked tortured. So between wicked and righteous, who should we torture? The wicked or the righteous? It's a very simple answer. This is how the Satan blinds the person. 
This is how it goes. The most simple way that a person can examine himself if his decisions come from a good source or bad is always by how? How? No? You should know it, all of you. How do you know? Before you want to do it, how do you know if it's a good thing in the eyes of Hashem or bad? When you have a dilemma. I mean, to eat pork or not, you know if it's good or bad. You don't need, uh, there's no dilemma here. But sometimes, like, like now, I just gave an example. It's a little bit questionable. Maybe she, th she thought she's doing a mitzvah, maybe. So how do you know when someone challenges you? Very good. You must have a chacham, a rabbi, that knows a lot. You ask him what to do. Rabbi, I'm about to buy this store. So what's this question? But it's like this, it's like this. Sometimes people come with stolen merchandise. It's not such a good area. There's crime over there. There are robberies. My wife will be worried at home every day until I get home. It's good money, but there's a lot of problems around it. There are sometimes two sides to the coin. Always. There's always two sides. You must ask a chacham. Give him all the details. You want to get married? Don't tell the chacham, Rabbi, my name is like this and her name is like this. Should I marry her? If you do it, you're the dumbest person in history. If you marry a person based on her name or based on his name, no one is dumber than you in history. No one. You want to marry her? Give all the full report about her. Madis, not Madis. Shomer Shabbat, not. Personality, traits, everything. Every family, education, history, record, level in religion, spirituality, prayers, Hashem, family, uh, brother, sin, the whole picture. There's always, always going to be some negative. Fine, no one is perfect. But once you know the whole picture, the more he knows, the better answer he's going to give you. If you only tell him 20% of the details, he may give you an answer, but it's not the right answer. It's your fault, not his fault. You are guilty, not his guilty. Many times people come and tell, ask me something, and they hide one important detail on purpose. Because they know once they're going to say the detail, I'm going to tell them what they don't want to hear. So they don't say that detail. Later on, somehow I find out about it from the other side or whatever. Oh, you didn't tell me about that one. That changed the whole picture. <laughs> Who are you fooling? Why you come to a rabbi giving him 80% of the information, fooling him, which actually fooling yourself? Don't go at all. You don't, if you go here, you must say all the details. This is how it is, and this is how it is, and if I'll do this, I'm going to lose here, but I'm going to make there. You understand? So you must ask a chacham, a rabbi. And if the chacham say you're not allowed to do it, then you know it came from a bad source, not a good source. When people send me guys that were extremely righteous, more than the requirements, they have a name for them in Yiddish. Frumkaitin. Frumkait, meaning... They always have to be more extreme than the public in religion. This is who Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, warned us, Al tzadik arbe. don't try always to be unique. Be tzadik, be righteous, but not always you have to be unique. They all here and I'm here. Everyone start keeping Shabbat 10 minutes before sunset, it has to be an hour. Everyone finish 72 minutes after Shabbat, he has to wait 90 minutes. Everyone buy meat from this place that the chief rabbi says it's okay. No, no, he's going to bring a shochet, bring it to the house, going to do only for me special. Everyone's going to buy matzot for where the rabbi says it's very good, it's kosher. I went there, I checked, it's very good. No, no, he needs special. Why? I don't trust anyone, I'm the best, I'm Eliyahu Navi. There are people like this. So Rav Shlomo Hafman said, when they used to send these guys to me, what, what, no, what do you do with them? 
the first thing I usually check is I put them in a conflict against the halacha. This is the most simple test to see if the righteousness is real or not. Or it's just OCD issues. It can be either way. Or it could be an OCD. Slowly, slowly I bring him to the knowledge, to the awareness that he needs a help, mental help to get out of his disease, which is OCD. He has to do it ten times again and again. I went, a few times in my life I went to places and people were saying Shema, Kriyat Shema in Shul. And they repeated every word a few times. You have to hold yourself not to come and give him a smack like this. Why? I'm Eliyahu uh, Anavi has to come get a lesson by me how to be tzaddik. He thinks, Ooh, I'm, uh, I'm going to die for Hashem. Sometimes it's all about show and ego. Sometimes it's a mental disease. One million percent mental disease. A person that daven, everyone finish between five and seven minutes, is praying half an hour. Now I'm not talking big, very big tzaddikim like Rav Kuk, Rav Ades, Rav Moshe Malka, Alava Shalom. These people were in a very, very high level. Still in very high level. I'm talking ordinary person that all of a sudden decided to be the new Rav Kuk of the generation. Three hours is praying now. A guy comes to me, he used to finish Shachrit at 10.30 in the morning. Meaning two, three hours he prays. Everyone finish in an hour, by him more than two hours. But no one wants to learn with him in Yeshiva anymore, because he come an hour late to the beginning of the learning. I asked him, what do you do until 10.30? He said, I'm praying Shachrit. I asked him, but everyone prays Shachrit and finish at, 10, at 8.30. Meaning, I pray one hour, you pray three hours. Why do you need to pray until 10.30? He say, it, I have to have full kavanah in Tfilat Shmona Full intention. And it takes me a long time. I say to him, the Mishnah Brura say, Mishnah Brura, it's Chafetz Chaim, on the Shulchan Aruch. I say to him, the Mishnah Brura says that in our time, meaning that was a hundred years ago, today, Needless to say, Hafez Chaim talks about a hundred years ago when they were a hundred times higher than us in a level. Hafez Chaim said that in our time it's very difficult to concentrate, to control the mind. So there's no point of keep trying because it's going to be a total waste of time. How oh, hammer? You try and try. It's very hard to hold your mind ten minutes without thinking about anything. Your wife, the bank, the weather, the noise that this kid is annoying you now. There's a lot of distractions. He started to argue with me that I'm too lenient in halacha, meaning you're not religious enough, Rabbi Hoffman. You're too lenient. I told him, I'm not a posek. I'm not a gdolado in halacha. Why don't you go and ask a chacham how long you should have kavana in tefillah and how long you should pray shachrit? How long you should be? I understand somebody goes 10 minutes extra, even 20. But two hours extra? They pray one hour, you pray three hours? Come on. I don't believe that any chacham will tell you that you have to pray three hours shachrit. He went to who? To who? To Rav Eliashiv, the biggest posek in the world. He lived until two, three years ago. Past 102 years old. Rav Eliashiv, say, Huffman told me that I can maximum stretch the prayers 20 minutes longer than everyone, not more. But I don't think it's enough for me. To have the right kavana. What do you think, Rabbi? Rabbi Yashif told him, Hafman is too lenient. 
listen carefully, he said to him, I don't allow you even the 20 minutes. Huffman was too lenient with you that he allow you 20 minutes extra. I say not a minute longer than the rest. Pray like everybody else. Finish with everyone. Go to the dining room with everyone and then start learning with everyone. He came back to me, this guy. Why did you send me to Rav Eliashiv? You ruined my prayers. Rav Eliashiv said not even five minutes longer. Rav <laughs> Eliashiv. I always tell guys, why you pray so long? Maybe it comes from ego and pride. No, no. I want to have kavanah. I want to have intention. I want to think about every word I say. I say, do you know one big rabbi in the world that pray more than seven minutes? Shmonaisre? Rav Ovadia, five, six minutes. Rav Ben Tzion Abba Shaul, seven minutes. Rav Eliashi, five minutes. Rav Shach, five minutes. Rav Moshe Feinstein, five, six minutes. Everyone the same. Did you ever see Gdola Dor praying to an hour? I'm not talking the special Kabbalists that I mentioned before. So different, all different Malach, the Kabbalah, the Rashash, the names of the angels that they have Kavanot. It's all different channel. Talking about regular, ordinary people. Ordinary people. Why do you think that you are more important than them that you have to have Kavana more than Rav Eliashiv? Or Rav Ovadia or Rav Ben Zion? Why? Your Yirat Shamaim doesn't even come to 1% of theirs. Your love to Hashem doesn't come even to 1% of what they have. So if they pray seven minutes, why exactly you think you need an hour? You understand? It's either come from ego, that everyone would see that you're special, you give your life, you pray forever, look what a tzaddik I am, or it comes from a mental issue. It can be in a mental issue. Some people repeat the same request 30 times. <laughs> 30 times, in one davening. Hashem doesn't understand one time. <laughs> How many times do you have to say to Hashem in one davening, give me money, 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 I need money, I need money. I want money, Hashem. Why you don't give me money? I want money. Why don't you understand? Huh? Say, Hashem, I need Parnassah. Please help. Goodbye. Next. Got the point. It was recorded already. Here you see an example if a person is willing to surrender to a doctor of the soul, meaning a big rabbi, and to accept the halacha, or he is arguing, thinking everyone is mistaken. They're all wrong. What do you think this guy? He also had something against Rav Eliashiv, I'm sure. Not only against Rav Afman. He's afraid, if he's afraid to go ask a rabbi, everyone that his wife tell him, go ask the rabbi before you do it, and he doesn't want, that's a sign that he knows he's wrong. If I know I'm doing what Hashem wants in the halacha, I will run to the rabbi, if she say. Let's go together, that you see. No, no, I don't want to ask the rabbi. Enough everything the rabbi, you and your rabbi. Enough. Why enough? Because he you knows the rabbi is going to tell him. And let's say he doesn't know. Don't you want to hear the truth? Maybe you're not objective. If a person is willing to be criticized by a big chacham, that's a sign that things comes to him from a good source. But if not, Shem Yerachem. Top. Time is running out, and we have to finish now this series, and we're very close to it. Very close, Baruch Hashem. Rav Shlomo, I came to ask forgiveness from the Rosh Yeshiva. He came to his chief rabbi in his yeshiva, Rav Isaac. From, he, from me, you're asking forgiveness? You never hurt me. I don't believe you will ever dare to hurt me. So why are you asking me for forgiveness? Adraba, you should ask from your wife for forgiveness. Not from me. 
Rav Shlomo. We're talking now the final meeting that he had with Rav Isaac Sher, the big giant tzaddik and chacham, Zatzal. He was Erev Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur Eve, Tav Shin Yud Bet, 65 years ago. I came to ask forgiveness from the Rosh Yeshiva. For me? You did not hurt me. I, wouldn't, I don't believe you would dare to hurt me. Why are you asking me for forgiveness? Adraba, go ask your wife for forgiveness. Rav Shlomo, I asked from her already. Rav Isaac, go ask her forgiveness that you came to pray in Yeshiva in Yom Kippur. Who says she agree? You left her at home and you came all the way to the Yeshiva to stay with us for the whole Yom Kippur? Rav Shlomo, I asked from her permission and she agreed. So why do I have to ask forgiveness if she gave me permission to go? Rav Isaac, that doesn't count to ask permission. Every kosher woman that her husband will come to her and say that he wants to go and pray on Yom Kippur in Yeshiva will say yes. She will not dare to say no. But that does not count agreement. That doesn't mean she really wanted. it. Did you offer her a suggestion? Maybe you stay in Batyam. I guess he lived in Batyam that time. And you pray Vatikin that when you come back from the davening, she can also go to shul and not pray at home. She can also go to the synagogue. Maybe you go to the early minyan that your wife will have a chance that you stay with the kids and she go while you're watching the kids. If after you offered her this option, she would still push you to come to pray in yeshiva, that's an agreement. Rabbi Isaac continued and told me, I don't allow you to pray with us in yeshiva. This is Erev Yom Kippur. He arrived to the yeshiva to stay until tomorrow night. Unless you go back home now, there was no telephones. Today, he would call his wife in front of the rabbi, put her on speaker. Rabbi said that I have to do this and this and that. She would give an answer. Here he has to now take a bus all the way back to Batyam, hour. To wait for the bus and go, an hour come back. Ask your wife for forgiveness that you did not really ask her permission. You just informed her that that's what you want to do. And after she tells you that she forgives you, then I will allow you to come pray in Yeshiva. Then he said something else. Ask her also forgiveness for all the times that you stayed after Tfilat Arvit to chat with people while she was sitting home waiting for you, thinking that you are praying, but you are actually talking to people after the prayers every evening. After she forgives you, come to pray in Yeshiva. Rav Shlomo, I went back to Batyam. I told my wife, Rabbi Isaac, say that it does not count to ask permission. I ask her forgiveness. She say, no, no, it's okay. You should really go back to the yeshiva and pray with them on Yom Kippur. I went back to Bnei Brak. I came to Rabbi Isaac. I say, now I want to pray in yeshiva. He said, okay. And he gave me a blessing. Birkat Gmar Chatima Tova. The Rambam is talking about two situations. One person does not feel that he's sick. Obviously, he's going to die. The other person, he feels that he's sick, but he does not do anything about it. Obviously, he will also die. The first one, we are always talking about awareness. When a person has drives and desires that motivates him and push him, he's not aware of them, he doesn't know that he has to fix them and to cure them. That's the most dangerous situation. You're not even aware that you have any disease in you, in your mind, in your mental state. Someone like that will never be cured because he's sure I'm healthy. And there's no pain like in the body when you're not healthy, the body sends pain. The tooth, the back, the knee, something went wrong there. So there's pain, but with the soul, you don't have pain. 
for sure, I'm healthy. Not, there's no need to run to a doctor, to a rabbi meaning. The second person feel that he's sick, but he doesn't have the strength to go to the rabbi to cure him. He smokes cigarettes and he knows it's killing him. He knows it's not good. He has no strength to change. He connects to negative things. He doesn't have the strength to fight hard and to get an advice how to get cured. Why don't you go to the rabbi? Why don't you take CDs and listen in a car? Ah, I'm a lost case, forget about it. I can't change. I know myself. No, no, it's not gonna help. I tried, it didn't help. What makes you think it's gonna help now? Chazal saying in uh, Baba Kama, page 46, man de kaivle azile veasia. Someone that has pain goes to the hospital. Aval imu lo olech le beasya. If he doesn't go to the hospital and he doesn't take care of himself, how is he going to get cured? The first type and the second type, when he follow his desires and will not take care of his sickness, he will die without a doubt. This is what the Rambam says. First rule, person should know his sickness. Second, will start acting on curing himself. First, you learn that you are full of ego. You're full of pride. That you're very lazy. That you're very jealous. That you're very angry. That you're very egoistic. You're very selfish. You have problems with your emuna. You have a lot of other problems. Now when you made the list, jealous, angry, selfish, egoistic, ungrateful, not modest, no faith, no generosity, laziness. Phew, what a list. You look at the list, you want to die. Third years I'm religious and I'm still rotten like a dead rat on the street. So what's going to be with me? What is all this religion for? A robot, Philin, this, Tali. Same, same guy, same girl, same everything. Same. See how they eat, go to the, <laughs> go to over there, grill point, stand by the window. See how people fresh their shawarma over there with their beard and peot. Like a tiger that just grabbed the neck of the zebra or the sheep. <sighs> Imagine if you come and talk to him in the middle, how he's going to hate you for the rest of his life. Reality. We see in a, in a shul sometimes how people push on the line to wash their hands for the meal, for the kiddush, for the chulent. There's only one thing. There are 40 people standing on line. You see these people like this. It's almost going to swallow you. Why? The chulent, maybe the, the pieces of meat won't be left. <laughs> I didn't come here to eat beans and potatoes. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, huh? You got the point. A murderer that murder people, sometimes he's convinced he does good. I, Rabbi, I don't just kill people. I kill people that deserve to die. <laughs> I do a lot of good to the world. I'm the only truthful person that takes care of these people. Nobody does anything about them. I sat with murderers that they told me they saved the world by killing this, this guy. Not that he's not even able to think that he did something bad, he's convinced that he did a wonderful thing and we all owe him a gratitude. I killed this guy, you owe me, all of you. Why you stick to extreme cases? Let's talk about ourselves, simple everyday life. Let me give you an example. People come to me to collect money for Talmid Chacham. I give 50 shekel, 13 dollars. 
They tell me, no rabbi, maybe you can try a little better, give a little more. It's a very big chacham, he doesn't have money, Pesach is coming. They start putting emotional pressure on me. Why? To make me feel embarrassed. To make you feel embarrassed that I should not dare to give less than a hundred. Maybe you do more. You have such a nice chandelier. You maybe give me more. Why are you giving me only 50? Are you allowed to do it? When you go collect, someone gives you five dollars. You're allowed to tell him, come on, make it ten? Are you allowed to embarrass a person that he will feel guilty to give you more charity? You're allowed? Then he goes to the yeshiva and break that he collected the most amount of money from all the guys who went to collect for the yeshiva or for this chacham. But inside he knows there's a problem with the way he functioned. There's a reason why I collect double than everyone. They get what they give them and I don't leave the person until I triple the amount. With all kinds of tricks, non-kosher tricks. But he won't ever go to a chacham to say, Rabbi, am I doing right or wrong? Tell me, am I allowed to do it, not allowed to do it? In Rabbeinu Yonah, Sha'are Tshuva, chapter 3, this is what it says. There is a tzivu in a Torah, lo tirdebo befarech. If you have a eved ivri, you have a servant, a, se, a slave, Hebrew, not Knani, you're not allowed to make him work too hard. It's your brother after all. Rabbeinu Yonah is teaching us there is a restriction to ask from a person to do something by making him embarrassed that he won't be able to resist. You're taking advantage on him by embarrassing him. I remember there was, I one time went to a lecture here in Queens and the speaker over there, in front of everyone, he started to come to the people. What's with you? You Shomer Shabbat? No. Hide the way. You know what it is? Now everyone is looking at him. None of one can handle the pressure. Okay, okay, Rabbi, I'm gonna, okay, I will, I will. Shechianu, mazal tov, ashrenu. Very nice trick. Oh, what's with you? I made you religious. Why you don't give me ever donations? Don't you see what I'm doing in the world? Don't you think it's ungrateful after I save your life and your family and now one time you send me a donation? Which is true. But who gave you permission to embarrass him in the public? He should have known it. You want to send him this message? Speak about it in a lecture. He may get the point, he may not. He's really ungrateful. But who told you that you're allowed to embarrass him in the public? There are things in life. But of course, now when he embarrasses him, yeah, you're right, Rabbi, I'm sorry. Okay, what's the address? I'm going to send a check. But who wants this kind of money? Embarrassing people for that? <sighs> a simple example, when a person makes a scene without realizing that his evil inclination is pushing him and hiding the truth from him. If we ask this guy, why did you give him, why did you make him feel guilty, unpleasant? He would say, me? I only educated him to stop being cheap. I'm helping him to stop being ungrateful. You know how much Hashem hates ungrateful people? So I told him, I saved your soul. Why don't you give donation to my organization? Why to strangers? What did they do for you? You have an obligation that people that help you. So I educated him. If he would stay the way he is, he's going to get punished when he dies, no? Or even when he's alive. Okay, so do it on one-on-one, -on, -one, on the side. In a nice way. Why in front of everyone? Why to intimidate him? To feel the pressure. It's all about that. 
If he would know that thanks to his donation, he would double his business. He would care that I embarrass him? That's what he answered. He told about everything. He would give a thousand of excuses to justify his way, no matter what you tell him. What I do, it's mitzvah rabbi. Don't, don't criticize me. I'm helping him. I'm helping him. But he cannot understand that maybe there's a different way to do it. There is a situation when people feel and they are attracted to their desires, to the pleasure. Everybody knows the nature of people and animals that they are hungry for pleasure, striving for pleasure. Always. There's not one hour in your life that you would say no to a pleasure. Unless if you're very big chacham, talmid chacham, you don't want to enjoy it from this world, yes. But ordinary people, this is the best restaurant over here. Come, let me buy you lunch. Wow. Right away. Okay, wait, let me cancel my appointment. There's a great party. Ah. No, no, you don't know. It's a $10 million home with a pool. Dancing, this, music, DJ, the best food. You have to see, you have to meet the guy. Yes. I'm with you. Don't forget to take me. There's a game. I got two tickets. Give me two minutes, let me make up a lie to my boss. I'll, I'll meet you downstairs. Pleasure runs the world. This is a situation when a person knows that these pleasures are forbidden, that his desires are horrible, but he is not interested to stop them. He wants to continue to enjoy and follow his desires, just like the drug addicts. Until now, we spoke about someone who is not aware that he has a problem. But even if he's aware, he has no idea how to get rid of it, to cure it. The Rambam now is talking about someone that is good. I'm happy like this, like most secular people. I'm happy in my way. Someone that is inside the bathroom and the smell is the worst you can imagine. How can he clean the mirrors and sing? Como esta senor? Oh, hola. Singing in Spanish. Que pasa, senor? You come inside, you vomit. <laughs> Counting the second to run out. And he's over there singing, enjoying life. Why? Give him one minute break. Come, come with me outside. And then send him back in. Then you see how he choke. Once you're inside the dirt, in the lowest place spiritually, you don't feel how horrible is your darkness. Take him to the light a little bit, then bring him back into the darkness. You see what's going to happen. Even us, when we are in a room with light and we go into the darkness, first second we don't see anything. Black screen. What happened after 10 seconds? We begin to see in the darkness a little. We get used to the darkness. The eyes adjust. You begin to see trees, these. You see the path. It takes you a second. That's it. You got used to the darkness. So a person doesn't want to change. I'm happy. Leave me alone, Rabbi. Don't talk to me. But I'm happy. Look what a business I have. Look at Christine. Look at the beach. Look at the jet ski. What are you talking to me about learning, yeshiva, this? <laughs> uh, you want to kill me? I'm happy with the way I am. It's like someone that drink water from the ocean. He's thirsty. He drinks salty water. The first second or two, when you drink it, and it goes in, supposedly it helps you. And a few seconds later, the salt choke you. Makes you a lot more thirsty. And then you want to drink more, like Coca-Cola. A trick. You think you, you're thirsty, you drink it. Two seconds later, you become thirstier. That's the whole point, to, to make you want to drink more. <laughs> Once you fulfilled your desire, immediately you look for a new temptation and a new way to fulfill another desire. 
more and more, and there's no end to it. Money, women, food, sport. The Gemara say, ever katan ba'adam, amar ivo savea masbiyo ra'ev. There's one organ in the body of a man. When he, feel, when he makes that organ full, he will be hungrier and hungrier and hungrier. If he makes that organ hungry, he will be more full and more and more until he doesn't have any problem. The opposite of what people think. I have to make some scenes, Rabbi, and it relaxes me. No, no, no. It will make you hungry. It will relax you for five hours, maybe. But then it's like a drug addict. Now you need again, and then you need again. Those heroin guys, ask them. It started with one, and then two, three, four, five, until it's every hour until they die. Overdose. They think that, oh, I'm going to do now, I'm going to relax for a day. No, tomorrow you're going to need twice. The next day three times. The next day four times. Until every 20 minutes. Every 20 minutes. He's going to a store, he goes into the bathroom. He cannot wait between, from the house to the store. Five minutes, ten minutes. He was in the house, he injected. He comes to the store, he goes into the locker room. Injects again. He goes again, supermarket, where's the bathroom? Until you find him dead in one of those places. He didn't start every 20 minutes. Started, then two days later, and then, 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 until Hashem Irachem. Same thing, women, same thing, food, same thing, everything. With people like this, there's not, much, there's not that much to do. They are falling in a category that the Torah warned from, Ki beshrirut libi elech. I follow my heart, I don't care. Head to the wall. There's a wall. Boom. I don't care. Nobody stops me. Bishrirut libi elech. Shrirut, it's shrir. Shrir, it's muscle. When the muscle shrink, it gets stuck in a certain position. I'm already stuck in my thoughts, in my mind, in my opinion. Don't talk to me, Musar. That's what it means. Bishrirut libi elech. Libi, it's where the evil inclination is. Who wants to know that he is thirsty? So he wants constantly to drink. But he makes himself more and more thirsty. The Rambam wrote the book Shmona Prakim to those who wants to go to the Chacham to get the cure for their problems. Those who do not feel that their situation is horrible and those who do not know how to get cure. For them, the Torah speaks. The Rambam speaks. For those who do not want to change, there is nothing going to help them. First, you have to make a decision, I want to change. And we see all the time. There are people, they don't want to hear. Kach takes Torah and science. I don't want. I'll pay you for it. Sit and watch. How much you make an hour? Ten dollars, I'll pay you twenty. Sit for hours, I'll give you 80 bucks. Sit and watch. Technically, you should have be happy, making double and enjoying, watching a film. Doesn't work cleaning uh, uh, tables in a restaurant. What's easier, to sit in front of a computer with the headphones for four hours and listen to some words and music and make double than what you make as a slave? Of course it's better. Doesn't want to hear. Why? It will ignite my conscience. I'm going to start suffering with my life. I'm going to see things I don't want to see. I don't want to change my way. Those who do not feel badavar, King Solomon said, Derech evil yashar be'enav. The way of the fools is straight in their eyes. Veshomea le'etza chacham. And someone that always open for advice from greater people, that's a smart person. Let me give you an advice. Sure, sure. What's the advice? What do you have to lose? Maybe it'll be a stupid advice. Okay, don't take it. Maybe it'll be a brilliant advice. I'll tell you an example. The astronauts in Russia, before they went to the space, they knew there's no gravity over there like here. So they were, they were trying to, they are, the Russian scientists, they were trying to break their head for weeks how to make a pen that the ink will come down because there's no gravity. That they'll be able to write. There was before there was computers like today. So everything has to be written. 
seeding, trying, experiments. They cannot come up with a solution. Then as a cleaning guy, Vladimir there, that was cleaning. After weeks, the, the greatest brains in Russia did not have an idea. Vladimir told him, I don't get it. Why don't you use a pencil? <laughs> Why you need a pen? Pencil? You sharpen it and you write. They all looked at him. They wanted to die. This cleaning guy is smarter than all of us combined. <laughs> Maybe it was the vodka. I don't know. <laughs> That's a true story. That's how they came up with a solution. With pencils. Nobody ever promoted him. Still cleaning the bathrooms. King Solomon continue. Shomea le'atzat ha'chacham, chacham. Listening to advice of the rabbis automatically makes you chacham. Before you even did it, what they told you. Just listening, it's already making you chacham. Smart people, always taking advices from people. Let me ask the accountant, what's his advice? Let me ask the lawyer, what's his advice? Let me ask my friend, he had the same case. What's his advice? What do you lose? Worse comes to worse, you lost a few minutes. That's it. Mipne shi odienu adar shu yashar be'emet. The Chacham will direct you to the right direction. Lo asher ech shevehu shu yashar. Not the one you think it's straight. The Torah says, Vasita yashar ve'atov be'ene Hashem. You know what's straight in the eyes of Hashem, not what's in, uh, straight in your eyes. Yesh derech yashar lifne ish ve'acharita darkei mavet. There is a straight path in front of a man that the end of it is death, meaning eternal death. But he doesn't think he's on the way to destruction. The sicknesses of the soul, of the spirit, when a person is not aware what's positive and what's negative, what will help and what will damage me. The ways of the wicked is dark. They will not know what will turn into an obstacle and a trap. But Achmelechet Refuat Anefashoti. On the fourth chapter, Rambam says, I will explain how to cure the souls. Evil in Hebrew. What's the meaning of the word evil? There are many, many names to stupid people. Tipesh, evil, as uh, Shote, Ksil, Metumtam, it's more slang. Metumtam actually, yeah, it comes from the Pasuk, when it's Tem Baim Rashi writes, Metumtamim. Metumtam, here you go, right there is five, but it's very hard to tell the difference between them. Each one is unique about something. What's Evil? En Akavana Tipesh. Doesn't mean he doesn't have a Sechel. Could be a great mathematician, big lawyer, sharp guy. What does it mean, Evil? A veil is not tipesh. Tipesh means someone dumb. Doesn't understand anything. A veil, it's not that. A veil, it's someone that is mistaken. He's, in a, he's doing a mistake right now. And he's sure that he's correct. You are in mistake right now, and you are 100% sure you are right, and they are, they are wrong. I am healthy, I don't need any medicine. That's called evil. Shomea le'atza chacham. But if you listen to the specialist, then you are chacham. We have mamash five minutes left, and we have ten minutes to finish the series, so I'll still five minutes of your time. We're almost done. For many years, Rav Shach used to send guys to me that were putting too much efforts more than their abilities in religion. More than in the learning. Rav Shach was afraid always that they will break. Once you break, you break for life. He was afraid they're stretching it too much. 
they learning too much, they killing themselves too much. But not everyone can keep up with the difficulty. So he used to call them and spoke to them that they will learn less. They did not agree. The Rosh Yeshiva tell them, learn less hours. No, no, Rabbi, I have to learn, no. They thought, what is it that the Rosh Yeshiva will tell me to learn less Torah? Is he out of his mind? Your job is to tell me to learn the more, not less. Rav Shach used to put a restriction on them. Learn Seder Aleph and Seder Bet. That's it. Don't learn Seder Gimel. 7 p.m. you're done. Don't learn until 10. He gave them some activities to do. Go make order over there. Go relax. Go. He used to tell them, go to Huffman. If Huffman will allow you to go back to Steigen, as usual, meaning to learn in full capacity, I will agree that you return to the Shiva for three Sdarim, not only two. But until I don't get it in writing from Huffman, I don't allow you to enter the yeshiva for the third seder, for the third period. I mean, not everyone, specific student. Person has to be released from his imaginations. Everyone lives in illusion and imaginations. You should recognize the sickness of his mind. Will not imagine that his situation and his traits are good. He should go to the Chacham to learn what remedy he needs. And don't make his own medicine to himself. Many people know they have problems and they make up their own solutions. Who told you it's good solutions can make things worse? Usually it's with parents that are torturing their children, giving them all kinds of punishments. Giving them all kinds of punishments. There is a guy that is criticizing his wife every day. And you know what? Something inside me tells me that at least in 98% of what he said to her is right. But she came to me and she said, I cannot take it anymore. I can't be married to this guy anymore. I really can't live like that. Every hour it's an argument, everything. I cannot take it. So one day the guy also called me to complain. And now I already know the other side of the story. So I told him from this moment on, you don't say another word to your wife about religion. She's doing this, she's doing that. He started to tell me on the phone. I said, I know, I know, I, I believe you 100%, I know. This is the way the generation is. This is the way the women are. That's it. From this moment on, you go back to her now and tell her, from this moment on, you can do anything you want in religion. Whatever you want. You want to eat pork, eat pork. It's not my business. You want to be Mchalel Shabbat, it's your life. It's not mine. I told you everything I could. Instead of accepting from me, you rebel more. I'm not going to be the reason why you're going to do more and more to get me angry. That's the nature of people. You tell them, they do it on purpose. Do whatever you want. That's your final chance. Now you have a higher chance that she will make tshuva and become to be righteous. When you take off the pressure. I'm not telling you what to do. Whatever you want to do, do. That's it. Eat whatever you want. Do whatever you want. I'm going to be religious. You, want, you don't want? It's your business. Rabbi, but I'm going to be held responsible in Shammai. I said, it's not true. It's clearly in a Gemara. Same way you have an obligation to say something that is heard. You're not allowed to say something that you know will not be heard. You try once, twice, three times. You see, not only the person doesn't change, you get angry. He hates you. It causes tension. It's going to ruin the marriage and makes him, in the end, become secular. And what happens to thousands of kids? Their parents did it to them. I'm sure the parents meant well. Don't get me wrong. Who wants to make his child secular? It's the biggest punishment to a parent. They meant well. But they didn't know what we learn here in this series. If they would hear this series. You know how many people told me, you don't know what this series did to my life. I realized that my whole way is wrong. Not one or two things. 
When you tell a person you're free. I once went to this French guy. For an hour he was preaching to me, why Hashem doesn't kill me? He should kill me. He showed me holes in the wall. I did it with my head. I did it with my knee. I got the point that this guy is so bitter and hates the whole world. He has no attention and he needs love. He's like a baby. Four years old guy. I said to him, you don't have a problem. You can do whatever you want. You don't need to keep mitzvot. I said, shote patu mi mitzvot. Don't, don't worry, you're not going to get punished. You can do whatever you like. What do you mean? <laughs> he started to laugh. <laughs> His roommate, which was 25 back then. I met him now a few months ago in Israel, fully religious, from that conversation. His roommate told him, you fool. He's telling you that you're dumb. You didn't get it? So he looked at him, because his Hebrew wasn't so good, it was French. He realized that I told him, you dismiss from keeping mitzvot. Meaning, if you tell me you bang your head to the walls, and you want Hashem to kill you, and I wish I'm going to die tomorrow, you're not normal. You can do whatever you want. Started to curse me, the worst curses, almost, he almost killed me. Get out of the house. The next morning, in the morning, it was by Rabbi Siman Tov Shul, Alav Shalom in Chaim Shal in uh, Coney Island Avenue and Avenue N. He went to pray Shachrit and then after a while, quickly after he became religious and he was making tapes. He had a machine making tapes of the rabbis and giving them out. The next morning, why? Once you told him, do whatever you want. No more criticism. You are, you're free. There's no, no show off anymore. He was trying to get attention. No, no, why, why are you saying this, God forbid, why should you die? No, don't worry, Hashem loves you. No more, do whatever you want, you want to die, die. The pressure went down. I'm almost sure, there's no guarantee, that once this person said to the woman, you're free to do whatever you want, maybe it will take a few weeks, yes, but then she will not have any incentive to fight anymore. She's free already. No more criticism. No. She, she will eat a few times, maybe not kosher in front of him. Maybe she will do things to try to get him angry. When he sees that he smiles and ignore it, what is the point? Most of the things that people do, it's on purpose. Many kids do things to get their parents angry. The way they dress things they do on Shabbat, the way they talk in the table. It's all because they are frustrated for putting them down. Even if the parent was right. That's really the truth. So Mamash for the end, it says like this. For a person to control his will, to always go in the right direction, he needs his brain to be clean from the influence of the evil inclination. That he should go to the bottom of the truth of the Torah. The more his midot will become more corrected, his traits, he'll be able to get attached more and more to Hashem. And to understand the wisdom and the divine, divine uh, secrets of Hashem. And his stamp that it's a met. The truth will become the ultimate way of his life. But in order for you to get to that level, you must eliminate the influence of the Yetzirah, which is, can only be done by devotion in learning Torah daily, all the time, and ignore and cut yourself out from all the nonsense around. The Rambam says, good traits, it means that I control my will. I control my drives. I control my desires. Not that I don't have desires. Sure I have desires. Same desires for food, for money, for women, for sport, for I don't know what, movies. Same desires. But now, not like before, now I'm in charge. I was a slave until this date. And from then on, slowly, slowly, I got free. And now I control what to do, what not to do. Not my desires will dictate for me. This control, it's not only for people who keep Torah and mitzvot. 
It's for every human being on earth, even non-Jews. If they get to that level, they'll be free from all the tortures that eventually will come to their life. The target, the destination that a person wants to arrive to demands him to be in control for all his wills and choices. In the army, if you cannot control the schedule and be on time and cannot fulfill the orders that they give you, you will end in jail. Put you in jail. At work, if you won't come on time, you'll get fired. Even if you have good excuses, you'll run out of them. The manager would say, I understand your problem, but I need workers here to be every day at 8 a.m. I'm sorry, I understand, I'm not blaming you, it's nothing personal, goodbye. Right, Shem Tov? <laughs> I cannot keep you, I'm sorry. In a grocery, when people depend on him to buy food, if he close any time he wants, his son has a game. He closes at 10 a.m., he comes back at 1. People come, they need bread, milk. One time it's open, one time it's closed. No routine schedule. He goes to the beach, go to play soccer with his friends in the park. Erev Shabbat, he decided Friday not to open. People were counting on him for chala, for Shabbos, for some food. He went to play. He would lose all his customers. Why? To succeed in a business, you have to control. Forget about your wills and desires and where you want to be. You have to do what's right to do, what you need to do. What do we see from here? No matter what the target is to achieve it, you must control your drives and your desires, your passion, your will, in order for you to achieve something in life. If a person will eat only what's delicious, he will die. Delicious, delicious, but only delicious you'll die. There's other things you need to eat to be healthy. Sometimes you need medicine. Very bitter. Without it, you'll die. No, no, I only eat delicious things. It's very bitter, doctor. You must take it twice a day. If you have an infection, next week you can die if you don't take antibiotics. No, no. <laughs> It's terrible, it smells bad, it doesn't taste good. It's supposed to be like that. If a person would only do what he enjoy from, I only do what I like, Rabbi. No one will force me to do things I don't like. Sure. Who likes to go to work, to get up, to run, to stand in a subway like sardine, in the winter, freezing, snow, this, standing, wind in your face. Instead of staying in a warm bed until 11, get up, make yourself espresso, coffee, sit by the heat, enjoy, play Pac-Man on your computer. No, I love work. That's why I go. Sure, yeah, I love. When it comes to religion, they have excuses. A person that his destination, his target, his goal, I should say, is to keep Torah and mitzvot, has to control his traits. You cannot do it without it. If you're selfish, you will never be able to do chesed. You won't be able to give donations. That's a part of the Torah and mitzvot. You won't be able to respect your parents. You won't be able to help your friend that his donkey collapse. Many of the mitzvot that the Torah requires, you won't be able to do. Why? Because you cannot control your traits. If you don't control your traits, they will interfere with your goal. You must control your will to be free from the influence of the evil inclination and to choose the right things always. You must eliminate the negative, the evil inclination. This is a spiritual infection who constantly on the rise. You got to bring it down, suppress it. Correcting the midot, it's not only for extra righteous people, fanatic. No, like something. It's the base, the base, the basics of every fearful Jew. That once he controls his will, his desires, his drives, he'll be able to keep Torah and Mitzvot in a superb way. 
Someone that cannot get up in the morning, he won't be able to read Kriyat Shema on time. Laziness. Caused him to lose every morning a very important mitzvah. Someone that cannot put his phone away in the middle of Torah lecture, he will always play loud in the middle. You don't believe me? Here. And check yesterday also in Bet Gavriel. And check the lecture before. And check the last 2,000 lectures. It always happens. Because there's always one that Hashem decides to do it to him. Why? In a Torah lecture you don't even look at your phone. Not to talk about touching it. Why? It's an insult for Hashem. Someone is teaching you the way of the Torah and you worry who left you a message. What would be the message? What will be message? What time we gonna meet tomorrow for pizza? <laughs> Someone that cannot get up in the morning will not be able to pray on time, will not be able to do Kriyat Shema. Meaning, the influence of the Yetzer is hurting him and his goal. Someone that is hard for him to control his eating habits. He will always eat non-kosher things. Why he cannot control his habits? The midot is the cause of the sins. The bad traits causing you to sin. Pride. All the fights you have with people. Ego. Here you go. Thousands of sins you make. Lashonara about people. Also pride. Anger. Jealousy. Bad midot causing you the worst crimes against Hashem. Therefore, if you eliminate the bad midot, 99% of your crimes an ideological crime, not only desire, ideological crimes will all be eliminated. That's how important it is to work on it. You know how many religious people are not even aware that the most important thing in life is to fix your midot? I never heard it. Some people, when they hear me saying it for the first time, in the name of the Gaon Mivilna and the Rambam and many others, they get the shock of their life. I didn't even know it's an obligation to fix my midot. As long as I keep Shabbat, eat kosher, give a check to the, ch to the shul, here and there, I'm happy, I'm a tzaddik. In your dreams. People think, everyone sins. I'm not the only one. The Rambam and the Gaon Mivina, Rav Israel Misalans, they explain. The sin is a result of your midot, your character. Everyone that fell and sinned in certain things that he has difficulty to overcome, someone that has desire for money, he will make sins with money, stealing, interest, cheating, selling stolen, buying stolen, selling forged merchandise, cheating the customer, lying in business, and many other ways. Talking Lashon Arab by his competitors, all of this comes from one sickness. Desire for money. Eliminate desire for money. No more Lashonara. No more putting your competitor down. No more stealing. No more interest. No more lying. No more cheating. No more buying stolen. None of this. Look how many things fall with it. One route you fix. Hundreds of sins falls with it. Daily sins. Every day. Every day speaks bad against his competitor. Fix emuna. 99% of your sin goes down. You have a muna in Hashem, why should I even say anything? Why should I kill myself for money? Someone that has desire to eat will eat not kosher things. Someone that is forced to make a sin, meaning he couldn't control himself, it's as a result of his weakness in his midot. A moment of weakness, the brain was not aware, he lost control and then he made a horrible sin. The Kabbalah, in Kabbalah, they say that everyone has ten sfirot, ten layers, ten sfirot. That the minun, that the um, quantity of each one of the sfirot is like making a cake. Salt, sugar, yeast, flour, water. From each you have a certain quantity, two cups, one cup, one spoon, three spoon. You, you can change the taste by changing the ingredient, but the, quant the, the quantity of the ingredients, it changed from a person to a person. 
The Rambam and the Gaon Mivina explain that in a person, some of the ingredients are more dominant than other. By one person, he has one specific thing more than what the other person has, but he has from something else more than him in his cake, meaning in his character. It depends on a few different things. Rav Yisrael Misalan say there are few different traits that everyone has and there are traits that not everyone has. For instance, there are traits that every human being has them. Everyone. For instance, everyone loves delicious food. Every person in the world not one person will tell you that he suffered to eat delicious food. Everyone loves it. Sugar, uh, whatever, salt, everyone loves food. Yes, there are people who control what they eat and try not to eat too much, yes. But everyone loves good food. Or certain other physical attractions, everyone loves them. But not every trait is everyone has. Not some people don't have anger. Very calm from the day they're born. Very cold, calm, indifferent, no, no, impossible to get them angry. Some people have no jealousy. They can care less what people around them have. Never bothered me what they have. I don't even look at what they have. It's the last thing I care about. Some people don't sleep at night. Now one night in their life they sleep from jealousy. And just every day find someone else to pick on. So there are certain midot he has, he doesn't have. She has, she doesn't have. But there are some midot that everybody has. No. Mamash, the last thing for today. Olech beyoshro yare Hashem veneloz drachav bozeu. That's a verse in Mishlei 14, verse 2. Olech beyoshro yare Hashem. Someone that goes straight, Decent is, a fear, is fearful from Hashem. Ki kol adam tzach lelech bedarko atzarich lo. Ki en midad bnei adam shavim ze lazeh. My straight way and his straight way and his straight way, it's not the same straight way. I have this channel and he has this channel. My job to teach Torah. His job maybe to be moel. His job maybe to be shochet. His job maybe to deliver. His job maybe to teach kids. Everyone has a, a different path that it's straight for him. His straight line is not straight for me. My straight line is not straight for him. Because of that, Zehu Ragil Be'avera Ba Me'ota Mida V'tzarech Ligdor Atzmo Me'ot Be'zeh That's why I have my weaknesses and he has his weaknesses. My weakness is nothing to him. His weakness is nothing to me. I laugh at his weakness, he laughs at my weakness. <laughs> How can he do it? It's crazy. How does he even can think to do such thing? So disgusting. And he thinks the other way around. How can he not do such thing? It's two different tests in life. What you need, your friend doesn't need, and the other way around. You need special guard, he doesn't. He needs, you don't need. Your special way, your special straight way, if you do it according to the way Hashem designed your way, even though it may look bad in the eyes of the public, because they like, they go in a different way and you go in a specific way. So they speak against you, Lashonara. Ki enam yodim ha'u tzarich. Af al pi ken olech beyoshro u yare Hashem. Don't worry about them. You do what Hashem wanted you to do. For instance, there was one in a Gemara that he looked like a goy with boots, dressed like a goy. He was working in jail. He didn't tell him he's a Jew. He dressed like a goy. No kippah, no nothing. Why he pretend he's a goy? When they used to bring Jews, he used to pre protect the Jewish women, that none of them will do something to them. The goyim. They put everyone in jail. So he was guarding. Now, if they knew he's a Jew, they'll kill him. What, you're protecting the Jews? But if they thought he's working there and he's a goy, they're afraid of him. The only reason he was walking like this all his life like a goy, because he actually gave his entire freedom to save those Jews from rape. And everyone say, look at this guy, look how he dressed. It is not a shame, like a goy. Who knows how much Lashon people spoke about him? And Hashem say, look at this tzaddik. 
Look how much he's willing to sacrifice to save those women. You understand? This is an example. There can be hundreds of examples. אבל מי שמעקם דרכיו הצריכים לו בשביל להתגאות בעיני הבריות לעשות דבר הישר בעיניהם There are people who twist their ways to find favors in the eyes of the wicked people Why? He doesn't want them to resist him אף על פי שאל עבורה ובמחמת זה לידה עבירה בו זהו If you go to satisfy the wicked people and you go down to their level, you become despicable in the eyes of Hashem. Hashem knows what you need and you're not doing what you need to do. Why the Torah was more strict with Ganav more than Gazlan? Ganav is someone that steals behind your back. Gazlan steals in your face. Who is worse? Ganav wait until you turn around and he steals from your jacket. Ganav, you're watching him and he's still from your jacket. Adios. So the Torah says, Ganav is worse. Everybody thinks Aslan is worse. In my face is still. Wait until I go then still. The Torah says Ganav more. Why? Because the Ganav is afraid of you but not afraid of Hashem. So he waits until you turn around and he's still. Meaning Hashem doesn't exist. The Gazlan doesn't care about you, doesn't care about Hashem. Meaning you and Hashem are equal. The Ganav, Hashem is nothing, but you count like something. You are higher than Hashem. In the eyes of the Ganav, he's afraid of you, but not afraid of Hashem. The Gazlan is not afraid of you, and not afraid of Hashem. So you and Hashem are equal. It's not as bad. The Ganav make the person here, and Hashem here. So the Ganav is worse. You understand? הנה באדם יש מיני כוחות. יש כוחות אשר המה בכל אדם כמו תאוות אכילה, as I say, אהבת הבנים. You love your children, you love food. Everybody has this. There are things that are not equal between you and someone else. You have desire for A and he has desire for B. Right? Someone that collected money There's one person that has a lot of money but will use it only for necessary thing and not for pleasure. Only, I need a new car, the car died. I have to go to work. Okay, I'll buy a car. Tefillin, I sign it for bar mitzvah. Yes, but $10,000 flowers, no. You need it? Yes, Abba. Proof. After an FBI investigation, he agreed to pay. But anything that is convinced that is not necessary, no, I have leak in my room, put a bucket. We didn't even have a ceiling when I was a kid. You have a room. We had six kids in one room. Put a bucket. No, Abba, come on, we're in America. It's not, forget about the days where you grew up in Iraq. We are in America now. Okay, no. Well, I'll bring someone to fix it. He will only spend money on what really is an emergency. That's it. There is a person that he doesn't even love the money. All he wants is pleasure. He doesn't care to have money in his bank account. I just want to enjoy the moment. And money gives me the pleasure. Give me the pleasure without money, I don't need money. His boss asks him, Moshe, why are you working extra hours today? I want to go on vacation to that place to do jet ski. So he said to him, okay, listen, instead of giving you money, I have a friend that has jet ski. Go there, he's going to let you use it for free. Instead of giving you money, he will agree. What do I care? I don't need money. I want the jet ski. If you give me the jet ski without money, uh, no problem. It's not here to collect money. Some people, the only reason they run after money is to show I made it. Look how much I have. He goes with his bank statement everywhere. Put it in his Facebook page, and large. Click here. Why? When I was a kid, everyone made fun at me, all the rich kids. And I was the only poor. Now when I made it, I have a drive from my subconscious to prove to the world I'm not poor anymore. That's it. That's the way it is. Rabbi Israel adds, There are three things here. One, tchuna. 
Those are the powers that a person comes to the world with. And he gain also from the influence of the environment. Two situation. The situation, the external situation that influence your traits. Changes in weather, hot, cold. When it's hot, it makes you angry, like me. Humidity, the sweat begins, the pressure goes up. Cold, I calm down. Some people, the other way around. Heat relaxes them. Cold makes them crazy. The weather change. A gray day, no sun, you become sad and depressed. Sun comes out, your mood goes up. It changed the way you function. The weather, the weather change if you beat Sadiq or Rasha today. The weather. Unbelievable. Or if a person is healthy or sick, his entire behaving change. Or if his wife made him coffee or not. That's how he started the day. It will be a great day today at Yeshiva. No? Hashem irachem. So what do we see? That there are certain things that change the situation around you, influence your behaving. And the third one, the third one, it's inyan, interest. What does it mean? Using the inclination, the strong inclination of every person, it depends on the inyan. What does it mean? Someone that has a strong desire for honor. He wants people to acknowledge him, to respect him, to give him compliments. He built the shul. Thanks to him we're alive. He is the greatest. Wow, he's the best, he's generous, he is, he is, that's what he lives for, for honor. So sometimes a person will dress expensive clothes to get honor. Sometimes it's the car, he is not into clothes, but he wants a very fancy car. He will drive this Bentley, everyone will already bow down to me. What, what do I care about clothing? I can come with shorts. They see I'm in with Bentley, they care what I dress or what kind of watch I have. That's already going to do the show. Sometimes it's the house. Sometimes it's how much Torah I'm going to learn for everyone to kiss my hand. I want everyone to know I'm the most genius one in yeshiva and in a town and in a city and in the country and in the world. For that, I have to write a lot of books, to give a lot of lectures, to prove that I'm the sharpest. So it's a very long journey until I'll get the honor. Every person find another way to reach his goal. One with a car, one with a house, one with learning Torah. Look at this. As long as I get to the honor, that's what I need. You understand? One time I had to go and speak in the American embassy about personal education. I arrived without a tie and they got offended. Rav Hoffman went to Tel Aviv, American embassy in Tel Aviv. Very, very fancy place over there. He can, Israelis don't wear ties, you know, it's a different mentality. He went just with a white shirt, but without a tie. The Americans got offended. Why? A postman have a tie here. You know? The chief came to me on the side and asked if I, would do, I wouldn't mind to wear a tie to respect them. Look how they got offended. By them, the honor is the clothing. You come with a jacket and a tie, you respect us. You come with uh, short sleeves, no tie, no jacket, you don't respect us and the place. When I was young, I went to Yeshiva Lomza in Petah Tikva. Also there they told me, why don't you have a tie? It's not honoring the Torah. You come to a place when people learn Torah, you have to dress the most respectful way. I went to ask the name of the person that told me, what's his name? They told me it was Rav Shmuel Rozovsky Zatzal, one of the biggest rabbis ever lived. He came to him and said, you learn in yeshiva, why don't you come with a jacket and a tie? Meaning, if that's the way to respect, that's how you come when you learn and teach Torah. The midot becomes good by keeping Torah and mitzvot. In one hand, the Rambam say, fix your midot, that you'll be able to choose the good and to keep the laws of the Torah. 
On the other hand, the Rambam say the opposite, that actually learning the Torah fix the Midot. Fix the Midot that you can learn Torah better and keep mitzvot better. Learn Torah better that you can fix the Midot. It's, a, it's like a, a two-way street. This A leads to, to, to B and B leads to A. And both are correct. It's not a contradiction. For instance, giving, being kind and generous. Olam chesed ivane, be kind to people. The Rambam said there are 26 mitzvot in the Torah of giving. Giving, like tzedakah, like masrot, pe'a, leket, shichecha, if you're a farmer, live for the poor. We are not aware how easy is giving. When someone knock on the door, even, even a little kid run to give him money. We got used to it without thinking, wow, what a great thing we are doing. This is generations of learning Torah. We are not thinking it's anything special. Five dollars, ten dollars, a hundred dollars. We give. Of course we give. People that never learn Torah, they would think, ma? Give five dollars to a stranger who knock on my door? You crazy? What is this? The mentality is not allowing. Because they never grew with that. So we see the Torah fix the midot. Barat Yetzirah, Barat Torah Tavlin. In many places, the Gaon Mivilna also said that the only thing that can fix the midot is the Torah. Without it, there's no way to fix the Torah. Amash, half a page, and we do siyum. Amash, another minute, and we're done. Zot Omeret, the activity in the sechel, in the brain, is influenced from emotion and from and the evil inclination distract your sechel. There are four different kinds of the nefesh. Hazan, hamargish, hamedameh, vehamitorer. Hazan meaning feeding. What does it mean? Physical activity. Margish, the five senses, what you feel. Five senses that we have, smelling, tasting, hearing, that's the five senses. Medame is the imagination, the power of the imagination.